too. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. I think the important thing is that this microphone works because otherwise the recording doesn't necessarily work. So I'm happy to just talk really loud so you guys can hear me. Um, and I'll just hold this so hopefully the recording works too. So good morning everyone. My name is uh, Lachlan and I'm going to be taking you guys for the first two action lectures. So a little bit about me. I'm actually a student myself. Um, I'm studying to be a high school science teacher over at ACU and our classes don't start till next week. So that's why I'm able to give you these classes today. So, just a few interesting things about me before we get going. One of the things I love to do is I play water polo. Interesting sport. And in water polo, you have to tread water a lot. And you have to be very good at it. So if you want to get good at treading water, a good thing to do is just practice treading water. But if you want to get even better, what you do is you strap weights to yourself while trying to tread water, and the weights cause you to drown. <laughs> and you tread even harder to stay up. And you do that for hours and you get better at treading water, is the idea. So what I've got here is four lead weights, and I just want to pass them around so everybody can get a feel for how heavy one of these lead weights are. So maybe we'll start them, I'll start them around different places, pass them around and just make sure they kind of all end up at the front again by the end of the lecture. So I might take a couple around the back. Here we go. So what do you get a feel? How heavy is one of these lead weights? I'll start one on the other side as well. Take them, take that one. So that's the first thing about me. Second thing is I love working with high school students. That's why I'm becoming a high school science and maths teacher. When you tend to get really bored in maths, especially period five Friday, you need something to keep them occupied. Origami is a great way to go. What I also love about origami is it actually builds up a whole lot of skills that we want students to have in maths. For example, let's suppose I want students to fold a cube like this. If they get stuck on a step and they can't figure out, they can't make theirs look like mine, they'll put their hand up and say, oh, what'd you do there? They'll actually ask. Normally in a math class, they don't do that. They just sit there and get stuck and don't do anything. So it teaches them to ask questions. It also teaches them persistence. It can be really tricky to fold a cube, but the end result is pretty awesome. So they stick it through to the end. It's also group work. You need six individual components that can be folded by six different people to make one of these cubes. They're really fun for throwing them around as well. Don't ever let them do it in the classroom though, because they'll never stop. But I'm gonna throw them to you guys. I want you guys to get a feel for how heavy is one of these cubes. So I'm gonna throw it in, and you guys feel. How heavy is a cube? <laughs> Good catch, guys. Who wants to catch this one? This one up there. All right, here we go. Oh, good work. Yeah. Right on the back. Did you see my other side? Good catch. Good catch. Yeah. All right, we'll have one. Good catch. All right, so pass the cube around. I want you to get a bit of a feel for how heavy it is. Well, you've got a lot of weights in that. Did anybody not get to feel the lead weight? Is there any other way to play Three all together. Thank you. Physics. Feel free to keep passing around while I talk. The reason is last year I did my honours thesis in physics and my topic was, it was unusual, it was a physics education project and it was about how we teach action physics effectively. <coughs> and so one of the things that um, I worked on in my thesis was the misunderstandings that people have about action. And so, in fact, I'm one of the world's leading best people when it comes to action misconceptions. So I know what you're most likely to get wrong, so hopefully I'll be able to fix that. Now you might ask, why are we studying action at all? The reason for that is historically, in fact I think up until the late 1800s, everybody thought classical mechanics was all there is. So you guys have studied that in first semester, if you were doing a semester one course, where you do Newton's laws, look at motion, don't keep the cube, you have to pass it back down eventually. I mean, well, don't throw it. No, oh, it's excellent. <laughs> if you guys can just gently pass them down to the front row, I'll just collect them until they get here. Thank you very much. All right. So people pretty much thought the classical mechanics is all there is. So they thought that physics was actually coming to an end. People being told, don't bother going into physics, 
is pretty much done. There's going to be nothing for you to do. Then, Einstein came along and came up with this whole idea of relativity. And all the rules they had about how physics worked changed. Then, they started doing even weirder experiments on really small things and discovered what we call quantum mechanics now. That happened in the beginning of the 1900s. But the way that we teach physics hasn't changed. We pretty much start out teaching people classical mechanics, and you just start to get a feel for that, for Newton's laws, which are actually quite counterintuitive, you know? Big truck, it's a little car, and they exert the same amount of force on each other. No way, right? But finally, you wrap your head around that, and then we say, sorry, that's actually all a lie. Relativity is the truth. And you have to completely change the way you think about the world in order to understand relativity. Then after you learn that, we show you quantum mechanics and you, everything that we just taught you once again is a complete lie and you have to change the way you think about the world all over again. Which is actually quite difficult. It means you have to keep, and often you have these compartmentalised knowledge. It's like, alright, here's my classical mechanics and am I doing a relativity or is this a quantum situation? What am I supposed to use? So the reason that we're going to be studying action physics is because action is the bridge that brings all of these subjects together. We want you guys to understand physics as one big consistent picture, not as <coughs> these separate ideas that it depends on what I'm studying at the time. So that's what we're going to try to do. Last year's feedback was tremendous, so we're going to do it again this year to help you guys try and understand action physics. So, oh yeah, that's right. I want to reproduce a very famous experiment from the 1600s. It's called Galileo's experiment. Has anybody heard of it before? A couple of people? All right, so essentially what he did is you've all had a feel for these different objects now. How much do you think one of these lead blocks weighs? Sorry? Half a kilogram? It actually weighs a bit more than that. Have we got another guess? Sorry, yeah, it's about 1 to 1.2 kilograms, depending on which one you got. They're all slightly different. So that's a lead block. Can anybody guess how much does one of these cubes weigh? One. Sorry? Somebody guess. Come on. 100 grams. You're pretty much spot on. About 120 grams. And they're actually remarkably uh, similar. They're all about 120 grams. So this one weighs about 10 times as much as this. So what I'm going to do is, unfortunately, to do this, I'm going to have to put down the microphone. Uh, oh, you know what? I'll get a volunteer instead. Can I have a brave volunteer from the audience? All right, there's a young man down the front. Come on up. Let's give him a round of applause. He's volunteering. <laughs> Sorry, what's your name? Chris. Chris. All right, can everybody say hi to Chris? Hi, Chris. Chris, you can say hi to everyone. Hi, everybody. <laughs> All right, so can I get you to hold the lead in your right hand? Good work. The cube in your left hand, and then no, I don't want you to break the floor. I want you to drop them very gently. Not yet. But before we do, we're scientists, so we're going to make a prediction about what we think is going to happen. So they're both going to fall, hopefully. Does anybody disagree with that? Anybody think they're not going to fall? Yeah, they're going to fall. Okay. And I want you guys to predict which one's going to hit the ground first. So can I get hands up for who thinks the le oh actually talk to the person next to you first. I want you to have a chat. Just in case anybody's unsure, I want you to all get the right answer. There will be a right and wrong answer. We're going to see which one is the answer.
Is it because you thought air resistance would slow down the cube? Is that the reason? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, over that short distance, it doesn't actually make. Get a high speed camera. Sorry. Get a high speed camera. Sorry. Get a high speed camera, and it would probably be a millisecond. I saw it with my bare eyes. It was definitely. <laughs> All right, so I did this with the year 10 class earlier this year. I was teaching them motion, classical motion, um, you know, Newton's law, that sort of thing. And we actually did this experiment. I showed them this experiment. We dropped them both, they hit the ground at the same time. Come exam time, half of them still wrote that the heavy one would hit the ground first, ignoring wind resistance. Half of them still wrote that. And I was like, what more can I do to show these students that they would fall at the same rate? We actually did the experiment. What more can I do to show them? And so I was talking to a colleague about it, and he said, you know the reason the students didn't learn the message? It's because you tried to teach the students the wrong message from this. Some people think that Galileo's experiment is all about objects will accelerate at the same speed in gravitational fields. And that's not true. The whole point of Galileo's experiment is that it shows that your intuition sucks. You think you know how the world around you works. You, you live everyday life, you, you know, move things, you've seen things fall, you think you know how it works. But actually, you don't. When Galileo did this experiment in the 1600s, everybody was shocked. They actually fall at the same speed. Nobody, like, everybody was shocked. And so what he, the key thing about this experiment was, at this point, he showed us we actually need to start being systematic, doing scientific experiments and being systematic in order to discover how the world around us really works. If we just use our intuition, we're going to get it wrong. The reason why this is a really important message for you is today I'm going to start showing you action physics and I'm going to start showing you quantum mechanics. If you use your intuition like, oh yeah, I think this is what's going to do, you will be wrong every time. <laughs> In quantum, it is completely different to everything you are used to. If you use your intuition, you will be wrong every time. So I need you to think of everything you've ever learned or have seen in the everyday world and throw it away and start again from scratch. It's going to be really hard, okay? I'm going to say a lot of things and you'll be like, what? How on earth does this make sense? Um, so you have two options in this case. One option is you just give up and say, oh well, it's whatever Lachlan says. Option two is you fight it and you try and break it into your understanding of the world. So I encourage you all, fight it. Try and get what I'm saying and understand it so you can make predictions about how quantum mechanics works too. All right, so that's Galileo's experiment. Now I actually just wanted to start talking about action. So to do this, I'd like to grab another brave volunteer. So, come on guys, I need somebody. Can I have hands up? One more brave volunteer. All right, Tate, come down. Let's give Tate a big round of applause. <laughs> Sorry, what's your name? My name's Tate. Tate? Nice to meet you, Tate. I'm Lachlan. Let's all say hi, Tate. Hi, Tate. Say hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. All right, good work. So, <laughs> what we're going to do is Tate, I'll get you to stand on that side of the lecture. You done? And I have one of these cubes, and what's going to happen is I'm going to throw the cube to Tate, okay? But before I do, I want to point out something very specific. Come on, slides. All right, here we go. So I'm going to have the cube at some point A here, so you guys are going to see it. The cube will be at a specific place and at a specific time right here when it leaves my hand. We call that an event in physics. So when we're talking about events, the important thing is it has a location, so a specific position, so x, y, z coordinate, and a time coordinate. Then, when it arrives at Tate sometime later, sorry, lost a few catches, you will see it in Tate's hand, that's another event, him catching it. It has a time coordinate and a space coordinate. So you can say it's definitely there at that time. That is an event. That is a technical piece of terminology that we're going to use again and again. So I need you guys to know what we mean by an event. So it has a specific time and a specific place. So in future, like if you write out the x, y, z coordinate, in future I'm probably going to be lazy and just stick to one dimension and pretend that x is a position vector. But the important thing is time and position all fully specified. All right, we can pass that. So this time I'm going to throw it to Tate and I want you guys to see what path is this cube going to take. So it's going to go through the air I want you guys to watch very closely and see what path it takes. You're all watching? You ready? All right, so event A, event B. Did we all see the path that it took? All right, somebody tell me what it looks like. Come in, don't worry, you're running this a bit. All right, um, can somebody tell me what did that look like? 
Yes, it's parabolic. Yep, it's parabolic, or close enough to parabolic. So, something like that. Does anybody disagree? Does anybody think it looks anything different? Uh, now I've given the correct answer, you probably don't want to say that. <laughs> All right, so we agree that the cube travels with the parabola. I'll take a silence as agreement. All right, can you pass it again? So I'm going to do the experiment again, but this time I want all of you to close your eyes. So you're going to see it at A, you're going to measure it at A, event A, you're going to close your eyes, and then you're going to see it again at event B. All right? So you ready? We see it at event A. Everybody close your eyes. All right, good. All right, you can open them again. Now it's at B. All right, what happens in between? Somebody tell me, what happened in between? What did it look like? Yes? We have no idea. <laughs> Don't you? Well, Does anybody have any idea what it might have looked like besides tape, of course? Yeah. Yep. Go on. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh -huh. It was the same as that. You're right. That's a really good point. So, I, know, I really like this. I want to go down this track for a sec. So, <laughs> I could have. Ah, move from the straight line towards tape, then I run back and say, oh look, it's an event B. That could have happened, right? We're happy with that? Well, we'll pass it back. So that's a path we could have taken. We could have done that. Or it could have done something really weird like this, right? Like that's a path that could have happened. That could have happened, yeah? Can we pass it back, tape? I think that's all I need tape for. Should we give them a big round of applause? Thank you for the So that could have happened, but we were able to say that it took the parabolic path. What assumptions do we need to make? So actually, I'll let you talk about this with your neighbours. So I'm going to tell you because I saw it. It did take the parabolic path. And you guys could have known that, but you would have had to make some assumptions about it. So can you discuss with the people next to you, what assumptions did you have to make to know that the path would do that? Or to know that the cube would do that? Talk to the person next to you. to make to get that that was the path. Yes? That you did what was easiest. That I did what was easiest. I don't think you really have to assume that, but all right, I'll take that. Uh, yep. I was just reacting gravity at the same level there. And okay. Yep, so we assume that we have a constant gravitational force, which leads to parabolic motion. Yep. Any other assumptions that we had to make? The same as that one. Uh, I can't hear who said that. Who said that? Yep, all right. You don't need to have Okay, yep. I'm looking for slightly more, so that's a really good one actually, because it's like, okay, we've seen it before, we assume it's going to do the same thing again. Um, I like that assumption. I'm looking for slightly more fundamental assumptions here. Uh, Man wearing blue? Um, there's no new forces introduced in the technical resolution of the surface. Okay, so you're saying that we you had to assume that we had to make assumptions about the forces. I'm still looking for more fundamental than that. Yep. It wasn't rotating as it was trying. Interesting. Like, the interesting thing about what that would do, we could still take that into account, I guess, and probably still mostly be parabolic, but yeah. Alright, so that was another assumption. I'm looking for more fundamental assumptions here, though. So, like, okay, we've got assumptions about the forces. I'm looking for something else. Uh, yes? There was only one time. force in, we well, can only make one movement, because the way it is, gravity is down, so we can change it. Okay, so 
so we can build up air resistance. So once again, that's about forces. I'm looking for something else here. Um, let's go up there. Is this the same Q? Uh, yeah, so we assume that it was the same Q. All right, let's have um, young man with the jacket. Can you just find me that? Okay, we'll jump on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is it uh, like sort of it took the most probable path, I guess? Took the, took the most probable path. Way, like it's the whole way to go and it will be the easiest. Okay, I'm not sure what you mean, but I like kind of where this track is going. Let's have right up the back. Uh, do you want me to take blood bath? Beautiful. That was exactly one of the things I was looking for. We're assuming it only took one path. It was only one place at one time. It's actually a pretty fundamental assumption. There's one other really fundamental assumption that I wanted to look at. Just can anybody guess what it is? Um, yeah, at the front. It actually left your hand? That it actually left my hand? Well, it definitely did, because we saw it at B, right? We didn't have to assume that, we saw it at the end. So, good try. Um, Alright, I'll take one more and then I'll just tell you. Um, yep. Efficiency and energy conserved? You did this, well, I assume that we assumed that, but we don't. <laughs> <laughs> we actually don't have to assume that. So here's when I look at it, there's three kind of levels of assumptions that we can look at. So one, we had gravitational, constant gravitational forces, Newton's laws, all that sort of thing. The second big assumption, this is a really big one, and this is not going to be true in quantum mechanics, so you need to break this, break the way you see this, is that we assume the system is deterministic, and we can predict what it's going to do. Or if we did the experiment once, and we set it up exactly the same, it's going to do the same thing again. Quantum mechanics, not true. You can do the exact, set it up exactly the same twice and get a different result. And it's going to take you a while to break yourself out of it. But you can actually get a different result from doing the same experiments again and again. You can. And the third one actually came up. We're assuming it only took one path. That it was only in one place at one time. Quantum mechanics, that is not true anymore either. By locating the cube. <laughs> multiple places at the same time. So obviously for classical objects that never happens, right? I mean, who's ever seen an object suddenly be in two places at the same time? But on the quantum level, this does happen. And I'm going to show you guys an experiment um, that was done at the beginning of the 1800s, which shows that this is true. So it's called the double slit experiment. Oh wait, before I do that, I'll just tell you guys about it. So there's two pieces of terminology. This is important, so if you're taking notes, these things are worth writing down. So the first one is, what do I mean? I've said the word path a few times. What exactly do I mean? So the path had to have a specific start event, so it had a specific place and time, and it had to have a specific end event, an end event where it finished. So it had an ending position and an ending time. And then there's one more thing about a path. At every point in time throughout the path, we specify a position. So we say that for one path, there is one position for each time. So for the cube, if it started here, then it actually has to be somewhere at every point in time. And if it's a single path, it can't be in two places at the same time for a single path. It has to be one place at every point in time. That's what we mean by path. The second thing is in quantum mechanics, and I call this the explore all paths postulate, in quantum physics, we say that a particle, something like a photon, or an electron, or a nu nucleus, or even sometimes even bigger systems, like entire molecules, when they're moving between two events, so event A and event B, when you measure it at A and you measure B, it takes every single possible path between the two events. So when we were talking about the cube before, and we were saying, okay, so it could have done this, like the parabolic, or it could have done this, or it could have done the weird thing like that. We don't say it could have done any of those, we say it actually did all of them. So obviously that's not true for a cube, but if we're talking about a photon or an electron, we actually say it took all parts. Question. This term, the cube is made of like photonic quantum particles. Does that mean each part of it takes all possible parts to get to the end? I love this question. So um, <laughs> this is something really complicated that I didn't want to talk about today, so I'm glad you asked. So, you'll notice that I keep using the word measurement. Measurement is something that's really important in quantum mechanics. So, essentially, things behave differently when you measure them compared to if you do not measure them. 
So if you measure one of these particles, you force it to be in a specific location at a specific time by taking that measurement. And it will actually behave differently compared to if you weren't observing it or measuring it. So then the complex question that comes up here is, what do you mean by you measured it? Does that mean you looked at it with a device? Does that mean, what does that mean? And so the answer to that is, that is what we call the measurement problem and it is still trying to be solved. Physicists don't know exactly what constitutes a measurement or what is it that causes particles to all of a sudden stop doing everything and just take one specific place. But we know that for big objects, when we look at them, like if I'm observing it the whole time, it definitely took a part. And then when we look at really small objects, we know that it's definitely taking all possible parts. But there's obviously this kind of gray kind of transition. We're going to be exploring that in future lectures. How do we go from particles that do everything to what we see in everyday life? So we're not going to look at that in today's lecture, but we will look at it in the next lecture or the lecture afterwards. So, sorry I didn't answer your question, Tom. Um, all right. So we're going to look at the double slit experiment. Who has seen a double slit experiment before? Did it look something like this in high school and you had to do a whole lot of maths and geometry? Yeah. Just go out. Yeah. 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 So don't worry. We're not going to be doing that. Um, all I care about is that you guys actually understand what the experiment's all about. I don't care about the geometry and predicting where all the fringes are going to end up and all that sort of thing. So if we have a little bit of a look um, in history on slides. Oh, that was on four. So, if we have a look back at the beginning of the 1800s, a man called Thomas Young did the famous Young's double slit experiment. What he did was he got a light source and he shone it through two very, very small slits. So normally, let's suppose that I have a big light bulb. So, um, light bulb. And then I have a wall with two big holes in it and I have a screen over here, what do I see? You can just yell it out. No, no, these are big holes in the wall, what do I see? What do I see? Okay. Yeah, I see a big bright spot here, and I see a big bright spot here. Like, the light just goes through the gaps, right? Yes? Yes? Okay. I kind of feel like I can convince you somehow. Um, try it at home. It's like a yeah, cardboard bit of box and put two holes in it, get a light bulb on one side, and you'll see two bits of light go through. However, and what you guys have probably been taught in your physics classes, if you make these slits really small, so they're comparable to the wavelength of the light. So the wavelength of optical light is about oh, on the order of hundreds of nanometers, like 400 to 700 nanometers. So if you can make the slits about that length, then you don't get this anymore, these two bright spots. Instead, if it's a white light source, um, you start to see all the colours get broken up into different fringes, and each of the different colours are in different spots. So every colour will have a bright spot in the middle, and then you'll have some blue fringes like that, and then try this green. So the green light will be in slightly different places, so you'll see some green fringes, so there'll still be a big one in the middle, but then these ones will be slightly further away each time. And you can get these fringes occurring. It's like, what is going on? And so the answer they come up with is, okay, so what we have is we have a light source, and light's actually not a particle. Light's a wave. Light's a wave. So we can explain it just by saying, okay, so the wave goes through both slits, we get destructive and constructive interference, so we get these nice bright and dark patterns like that. The only thing is that they actually managed to kind of show that that's not the full explanation because they took objects that they know are particles, like electrons, and did this experiment and got exactly the same result. So it's like, okay, I guess electrons can interfere with each other as well. But then they messed that up even further by doing this experiment with one electron at a time. So I'm going to have a really, really faint electron gun that only shoots one electron at a time through this slits. What do you think is going to happen? Talk to the person next to you. Decide what do you think is going to happen. We'll take a vote. Talk to the person next to you.
So let's have a vote. So who thinks if I do one electron at a time, I'm just going to see some electrons build up over here, so one spot here, and some electrons build up down here, two spots. Who thinks that's what I'm going to see? So we have all these electrons going through this hole and building up in a spot over here, and another lot of electrons building up in a spot over here. Who thinks that's what I'm going to see? So, okay, we've got a few. Alright, who thinks I'm going to see an interference pattern like what I see there? One electron at a time. Most people. Does anybody have any alternate theories about what they think might happen? Alright, I'll show you the results. It was published in a paper, and this is what they saw. So originally, electrons just seem to be random arriving, uh, arranging, arriving randomly. Then, over time, we see the build-up of electrons on the plate, and all of a sudden, we start to see that there are, in fact, bright fringes and dark fringes. So what this experiment showed, the only way to explain these results, and Feynman put this, um, except explain this in what he calls the many parts approach to quantum mechanics, the only way to explain it is the electron doesn't just go through one slit, because that would lead to the bright, two bright spots. Instead, one electron takes all possible paths, it does all possible things available to it. So it goes through here and through this slit, but not only does it do that, it also does some weird path like this, where it arrives like that, it does the weird loopy loop path, it takes all possible ways to get from event A to event B. Questions? Yes. Fight this. I know this is going to like blow your minds. How come? Go on. Question. Um, if you counted how many electrons you showed passes ago and how many electrons landed on the board, would they be? Not necessarily. I think a lot of electrons would have hit the screen, but I haven't read that part of the paper. But I'm assuming a truckload hit this. So yes. If you take any possible paths, doesn't that mean shouldn't it impact it everywhere else? Sorry? Shouldn't it impact over the whole screen? Okay, I like what you're saying. So, it's like let's... you're not watching, you just know that it hits the screen somewhere. Yeah, so we're going to explore that a little bit further. In quantum mechanics, we can't say for definite where that electron is going to go. Like we did the exact same experiment like hundreds of times and it landed in a different spot every time. So we can't predict exactly what will happen. However, we can predict with probabilities. And that's what I'm going to be showing you guys for the rest of today's lecture, is how we can calculate the probability of the electron arriving at a certain position. So I'm going to start off with the easiest case, the symmetric case. Let's suppose that we want to calculate the probability that the electron lands right in the middle of the screen, right there. So as I was saying before, if we want to do this, we have to assume that the electron takes all possible paths that join event A to event B. So there's a specific position and time here, specific position and time here. So what I do is I say, okay, my electron starts here, so it could go like this, that's one possible option. It could go like this, that's another possible option. And I actually have to do this for every single path that it could take. Which is actually a little bit of a problem, isn't it? Because there are infinitely many paths. Like I could come up with infinitely many ways of drawing these lines in between the two. So this is going to get really complicated really fast, right? Mm. Yeah? Anybody like integrating over infinity, infinitely many paths? <laughs> Anybody ever actually done it before? <laughs> well, really? Variation of power. Okay. I've got to admit I don't know what that is, but that's <laughs> um, It's tricky. So it so happens that, and this is where the principle of stationary action comes in, which I'm going to tell you more about in the next lecture. It so happens that if I just consider this path here, this path here, and the paths that are nearby, those are the only paths I have to consider. The reason is that all the other paths are going to destructively interfere. So I'm going to show you partially how that works this lecture, and then I'm going to show you a bit more next lecture. So, so if we're going to calculate the probabilities, the way that I do it, it's pretty simple. I just use this formula here, which we call the Born Rule. If I want to know the probability of going from A to B, I just get this, comp this thing called the amplitude, take its modulus, so how big is the amplitude, and then I square it. So there we go, we're pretty much done, right? The only problem is, how do I get the amplitude? 
So this is the more complicated part. So this is how we define the amplitude. Um, yeah, you can write this down as well. Um, so what I have there is some normalizing factor, n. We're not going to be talking about that at all in this course, I don't think. But essentially, it's the idea that if we have infinitely many parts, this thing could get infinitely big, so it's some sort of normalizing factor that keeps it down. It also depends how you break up your parts, how high on you put the parts next to each other. So that's all taken into account in n, and we're not going to talk about too much. So sigma, that means sum, so we're going to add up this term here for every single part between the two. So this exponential here, um, it's i. Has everybody done imaginary numbers before? Can I get hands up for who's done imaginary numbers? Thank goodness. Because um, I really don't have time to start from there. I'll very briefly mention it later. So um, i times s, which is the action, which I spoke about and defined before, over <coughs> x bar, which is Planck's constant. So that's pretty complicated. Luckily, we'll consider the case where we're just talking about light. So this allows us to simplify it a bit. For light, for those of you who were early today, you got to see uh, we derived this. For light, the action, that crazy S quantity that's very hard to understand, is just directly proportional to the time. So it's just H bar omega T. And the H bars cancel out. So now it's just the complex exponential of omega t. So what I'll do, what are you guys right? I'll just talk very briefly about imaginary numbers. So if we imagine that we have the real number line going across like this, so then I've got zero here, um, then with some space later I have one, two, three, and so on. So then I have minus one, minus two, minus three. So real numbers are great. Um, there's no gaps in them because we managed to come up with fractions and then thirds and all these sorts of things, which means that, okay, I can take the square root of any of these numbers on the positive line, and that means I can find the answer. The only problem was that when I started to take the square root of the negative numbers, there was no possible, like, damn it, there's no square root of minus one. So mathematicians invented i, which is kind of like this new dimension into the imaginary. So we have minus i minus 2i. And this is our complex plane. So along this line, we have the real numbers. Here we have the imaginary numbers. Unfortunately, now we have imaginary numbers. We can't just say that everything is either strictly bigger than or smaller than something else. But, um, oh well. Um, <laughs> the price we have to pay to get the square root of minus 1. So what I'm going to do is I'll just rescale that so it's a little bit bigger. So we're just going to look at a unit circle. So that's the circle of size 1. The reason I want to do this is I want you guys to get a feel for what that term there, the exponential, actually looks like. So, let's suppose, so this is i, um, I'll call that a minus, uh, sorry, minus 1, minus i, and this one 1. Even if you think you know this, pay attention, this is important. Um, so then I have my unit circle, <laughs> <laughs> my unit oval. <laughs> the point of the oval is that everything is equally distant from the point there. Um, so it doesn't matter which way it's pointing, it's still one. I'll try again. I think you guys get the idea even if my circles are only billion, so it's not brilliant. Okay, so I have the unit circle. This function here, what it does is that when t equals zero, essentially all I have, oh, do you guys know Euler's identity? Do you guys know what it is? Yeah. I'll write it up just for you guys who don't know. So, um, there's e to the i of x equals cos x plus, wait, plus or minus? Plus. Yeah, plus, thank you. <laughs> minus sine x. So if you, like, what would this function do? The answer is this is what it does. So if I have t equals zero originally, that means, okay, sine of zero goes away, so it's all real, and it's just one. So essentially, this function when I have t equals zero, it just starts at one. <coughs> then, all it does is go around the circle, like this. So, an easy way to think about this sometimes is just as a stopwatch. This function here is a stopwatch. So it starts and it just goes around. 
that the right back you guys touch in that way? Is that clockwise for you? Yes? Yes, clockwise, excellent. Figure that out. Okay. So, there's kind of two, I apologise, so this is two main notations that we use. One of them is this one here where we start at one because it fits in really nicely with the function and we go around anti-clockwise. The other one is, oh, we like to think of it as a stopwatch. So we start pointing straight up and then we go around anti-clockwise. So, wait, clockwise. So I apologise, you might come across two different notations for which way these things are pointing and there's nothing I can do to reconcile that so you'll just have to uh, figure it out. I apologise. So, we can kind of represent this function here just as an arrow that points in a different direction depending on what t is, which is really handy. So now our equation essentially becomes our amplitude is just equal to our normalising factor and you add up all the stopwatches. You can do that. Alright, so for simplicity in this lecture, we're just going to consider the straight line parts. So if I bring that down. We're only going to consider what happens if I look at this part and this part. Next lecture we're going to start looking at what happens when you consider all the possible parts. But luckily in this case it's going to give us exactly the same answer, so it doesn't matter. So here we go. So on the slide, essentially we can imagine for this top part, it starts pointing upwards, goes anti-clockwise, and then it takes an amount of time which means I end up pointing exactly straight up again, just like that. So for the top part, my stopwatch points straight up. So like for the top path, I have an arrow that points straight up. For the bottom path, it's exactly the same time because of the symmetry of the situation because we're considering the midpoint. So in this particular case, it will go around exactly once for the bottom path as well. So if I draw my stopwatch for the bottom one, it's also an arrow. So then I need to sum all possible parts, add all my phasors. Phasor is the word we kind of use for these arrows or these stopwatches. So phasor. So I add all my phasors together, head to tail. So in this case, they're pointing in the same direction. It's just like adding vectors, it looks like that. And that purple line there, the size of that is the amplitude. So I take that and square it, and that gives me the probability. So it's two purple lines. Sorry? No, square it. So it's like making a square out of the purple lines. Mathematically, you just put it squared in your calculator and you get out the answer. <laughs> Um, so in this case, we're going to construct an interference. These arrows are pointing in the same direction, so there will be a large probability that I find it here. So that probability is going to be less than one, so there's a chance I'll find it in other places, and if I was taking n into account, we could actually put a number on what that probability will be. But at this point, I don't need you guys to necessarily know how to put an exact number on this. I want you guys to understand the process, that we consider all the different parts, and then we look at how these different arrows add together. So, that was the case where we considered the very middle, like that. If we consider the case now, where we don't have the symmetry anymore, let's suppose we move out, we want to consider, we want to calculate, we start with the photon at A here, but we want to know what's the probability that arrives at this event here, B, up here. So now, it's a little bit different because this path is shorter than the path down here. So it looks something like that. So this time, when I have my stopwatch for the top path, so it starts up, it goes all the way around, it doesn't have to travel quite so fast, so I might end up pointing in that direction, something like that. However, the bottom path has to travel longer, so it originally points up, goes around, there's a full rotation, then it might end up pointing in some other direction, like that. So, okay, those are my two phasors, alright. I've got to add them together. So that's like adding vectors head to tail. But these ones are pointing in opposite directions. So essentially I end up in nearly exactly the same place where I started. So, in this case my amplitude is tiny. I'm getting destructive interference. So the probability, I take that little amplitude and square it, the chance of actually finding the photon or the electron, whatever my experiment is at B, that particular point is very low. So this is really different to classical mechanics. In classical mechanics you could say, alright, it's going to do exactly this. Here we're saying, alright, it starts here, we want to know what's the probability it ends here, we don't even know it's going to end there. 
But what's the probability that it ends there? And even worse, in the middle, we say it does everything. Yeah? This is what we're saying. You go from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, and it all, like, you have to completely change the way you think. It's extremely complicated, but I want you guys to fight it, like try and take this in and reconcile it with your knowledge that you already have. So, um, does anybody have any questions about anything else said so far? Yes? Regarding the little n to disruptive in GM, where's the crossover between disruptive and constructive? That's a great point, really. So, if we say complete destructive interference, it means that there's zero probability. Complete constructive interference would mean that they're all pointing in a straight line. Um, there is no set definition about which one's which, like, or where the gray line is. You just get interference in general. Does anybody have any other questions about anything that we've said today? Yes? Well, when you say the all possible paths, is it that thing in terms of many copies or just or is it split up? So you're asking about, when we say it takes all paths, what actually happens? So the tricky bit here is, it's hard to say, because if we measure it, we mess it up and we force it to just be in one location. So when I say it takes all possible paths, nobody's actually seen it take all possible paths, because to do that, you'd have to measure it, which would stuff it up and it wouldn't be taking all possible paths anymore. However, if we treat it as if it did take all possible paths, then mathematically, we get out exactly the probabilities of what we expect. So you can imagine that as the electrons put things a lot, million electrons can go do all the different things. Or usually what we call it is something called wave function, which we're not going to talk about very much here. Um, in this particular section of the course, but if you do quantum mechanics next year you will. Um, and so that's the way that we like to think about it. Does anybody else have any more questions? If you do, oh, all right, I'll take this one, and then if anybody has any more questions after that, feel free to ask me at the end. Yep? Uh, does it necessarily have to go through the slits? Doesn't necessarily have to go through the slits. So you're saying, can it just teleport from one place to another, and can I count that as a reasonable path? So there's a little bit of controversy about this, because as I said, we can't measure the path directly. So it's all about what maths gives us the correct predictions. And it so happens that you can include paths that travel faster than the speed of light. So you kind of can have this teleportation thing. The most important thing is that each point in time there is a position. But it so happens it doesn't matter which way you do the maths, you still get out the same answer for a really cool reason that I'll be telling you about next lecture. Um, so as I said, any more questions I'll take at the end of the lecture. Before you go, there's two important things I have to tell you. So you guys need to write this down, so don't pick up your books. All right, first thing, Friday's lecture is cancelled cancel because it's Bush Day, Bush Friday. Yeah? <laughs> so no lecture on Friday, but that means that I have homework that I expect you guys to do. Oh, and so the homework's not too bad. So what I want you to do, oh, I'll drag this is really important, so don't go because you can drag this down too. Um, so, because there's no lecture, I expect you to watch these two videos. The first one's eight minutes, the second one's 20 minutes, they are really, really good. Watch them and try to understand them and send Craig and I emails or come to our office and ask us questions if you don't understand them. I expect you to do this and I expect you to know this for the next lecture. Okay. Um, are these questions about the homework or? Yes, okay. Are the slides uh, addressed the original model? I will probably email them to you. Craig has a version of them on Wattle, but when I tried to access those ones, they didn't work and I just tried it this morning. So I'm going to email you ones that I upload onto YouTube that definitely work. So, all right, so before you guys go, this is one of these are the key things that I expect you to know from today's lecture. So, what I mean by a path that has a specific point, um, for every point in time, it's in a specific place. In quantum mechanics, we say a particle takes four possible paths. Then, the other thing you need to know is how do we calculate the probability? So, we assign a phase or or an arrow to each possible path. Then we add all those together, and by squaring the result, you get your overall probability. So those are the key things. If anybody has any questions, just come ask me afterwards. I'll see you guys on Monday. Do your homework.